attacking, crushing inevitability of time, and we all have one foot in the grave tumble! Don't really know where we're gonna go from here, but... We are all but lambs. Lambs that walk upon the path of life. All together. And we will all fall together by the Reaper's scythe. Uh. Well, Jesus, that, um, that certainly set the mood. <laughs> the Reaper is waiting over all of our shoulders, guys. Honestly, the only thing I have to say about that is if I can request a Reaper, can it be Rongiku? Can can Rongiku be the one to come and reap my immortal soul when my time has arrived? I bet, you know, like, all of them kind of, like, if you actually got to see, like, it really is, like, in Bleach, where it's, like, the Shinigami come down and do the cone zone, whatever, and be like, okay, we could get this really cool guy with a face tattoo, or we could get this kind of, like, depressing-looking guy, or we could get this old dude, or we could get... Rangiku. I think a lot of people would be requesting Rangiku, right? Okay. Well, anyway, today we are talking about Espata number two, Baragon Ruizenborn, um, who is the former king of Huecamundo, and his aspect of death is aging, or just the inevitable crawl of time is another way to put it. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of people are thinking, like, when, when are we gonna get to Baragon? Come on, Tekken, let's get to Baragon, let's get to it. We talked about Stark, and Haribel, and Ukiora, and Noitra, and Grimjow. Baragon is pretty much the only, like, major Espada, outside of Neliel, because Neliel's not really an Espada, you know, in the current storyline, but still, close enough, right? So Baragon and Neliel, I think, are the two videos everyone's really hyped for, so... Okay, so Baragon, my god, he's, there's just so much to unpack with him, <laughs> so much. Um, I said this in the last one, but I just want to bring it up again, because a lot of people have been kind of curious about it. When you actually start to think about it, Baragon being the number two Espada, I mean, Stark was strong, absolutely, and then you might also think maybe the Espada were ranked purely on their raw physical power, you know, because, you know, Yami being number zero, or, you know, like zero, you know, Seto Espada, you know, he might have been, like, physically the strongest, but he obviously was wasn't the smartest, he didn't really have any kind of unique abilities, and just in terms of, like, raw physical power, Yami was the strongest, right? And then Stark was pretty strong, too, he was able to divide his soul up, but if you look at it just from the perspective of Baragon's ability, his respira, his death breath, the ability to literally send out this uh, miasma, this haze, and anything it touches just ages into dust, and, and beyond dust, it just disintegrates and just poof into nothing. Um, you definitely could see him as a contender for the number one Espada, and I'm gonna go along with my theory. I mean, I kind of halfway said it as a joke last time, but thinking about it a little more, Aizen might have very well just made him the number two Espada just to screw with him, just to spite him, just to be like, oh, he thinks he's the king? Oh, okay, well, I'm gonna, you know, I'm the new king on the block. I'm gonna put him down a peg. You know, you can imagine Baragon, you know, basically being forced into Aizen's army. Um, let's just start with that, I guess. So Baragon was the former ruler of Huecamundo before Aizen and Gin and Tozen came to town, all right? Um, he was the ruler for a very, very long time. If you go by the Can't Fear Your Own World, World light novels. I mean, we're talking like, you know, time and memoriam. Like, as long as there was a Huecamundo, there was a Baragon that ruled over it. You know, it's just like he is the eldest out of all of the Vasto Lorde Hollows, to the point where it's even kind of ambiguous whether or not Baragon is even a Vasto Lorde. I mean, in terms of power, he might be similar, but he's just so ancient, it's like he might be something different altogether, right? And his appearance is quite literally like the stereotypical Grim Reaper. Now, I know the entire series of Bleach is about Shinigami or Death Gods or Soul Reapers, but when it comes to the actual, like, you know, uh, old-school historical depiction of, like, the Reaper, like, during the Black Death or whatever, it pops up in, like, uh, various, like, uh, codexes and, and books in our past, he looks like that, you know, he's a skeleton, yo -ho, -ho, ho get ready, there's gonna be a lot of Brook jokes in this one, here's one right now, Soyphone, can I see your panties, Soyphone's like, ah. 
I mean, come on, I talk about a rockin' strumming guitar skeleton in the other series, and now here we're talking about the literal Grim Reaper. I think Brook and Baragon would get along. I can see them hanging out, right? You know? Um, but no, anyway, yeah, so he was a he was around a very, very long time ago since all that stuff, and he ruled over the entirety of Wake Mundo. Whatever his eyes saw was his kingdom, which is pretty difficult and quite impressive, honestly, because he didn't have any eyes. Yo! <laughs> all right. Um, anyway, yeah, to the point when uh, Aizen and Tozen and Gein arrived, they noticed, you know, they're in this basically not really a palace. It was just like a, a specific area of Wake Mundo that had like stone and then you had Baragon's throne there and you had like a bell tower and, uh, you know, Baragon's like, welcome to my palace, Las Noches. And Tozen was like, oh, well, and it's kind of a weird palace you got here. It doesn't have any walls or a ceiling. You have The king of Wake Mundo has a bit of a funny bone. Yo! Okay, that was actually in the translation, probably not in the actual Japanese, but it was in the translation, so you can't fault me for that one. I had to make a Brook joke there. Uh, also, it's funny that Tozen is the one that mentions... You, get, you don't have any walls or ceilings here, you know? Okay, whatever. Anyway, Baragon states he doesn't have any need for walls or ceilings. Ah, paltry ceilings? Those are for ants and mortals. I am a god, you understand. Do you see me? Do you see what I am right now? I'm literally a walking, talking skeleton. Can you think of anything more terrifying than that? You know, and honestly, probably, like, Eisen and everyone's like, yeah, we can actually think of a lot more. Like, there's actually a lot of hollows that look way more terrifying than you. You know, you're, you're a skeleton. Okay, cool, whatever, right? I mean, we're Shinigami. We've seen a lot of weird stuff in the world. But he says, you know, because he rules over all of Wake Mundo, he has no he has no need because the sky is his ceiling, you know, essentially, you know, okay? So, um, a big theme of Baragon from day day one is his arrogance, okay? Uh, even the name of his Zanpakuto is Arrogante. And his uh, release command is Rot. Rot, Arrogante. We don't really get to see a lot of Baragon's uh, Zanpakuto, because literally he only pulls it out when he's about to release it, but it looks like a giant, it's just a giant broad axe. It looks super badass, right? Now, his Grand Kaido, when he goes into his Resurrection, it looks cool. It's like a more, like a, it's, he refers to it as a guillotine, which it's not a guillotine, it's 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 an axe, Baragon, but I know what, I know what you're trying to get across here, trying to be really fancy and whatever, but um, it's an axe. Let's not kid ourselves. You know, this is a guillotine, this is an axe. Max, okay? All right. Sweet. Um... But I did like the design of his original Zanpakuto first. I wish he would have gotten to use it a little bit more. I like that little gemstone in the center, that eye. And when he activates it, like, rot. The, the eye, like, flares up. And, like, the fire, like, this jet ba uh, black flame shoots out of the axe. I think it's red in the anime. But, it like, I think it's implied to be more black in the manga. Um, this jet ba black flame emits from the gem and, like, torches and, like, burns his skin off, revealing his true form, okay? Actually, I kind of wonder how weird that must have been for Baragon when Aizen turned him into in a wrong car. He took out the Hogyoku and be like, you will be a member of my army now. I can grant you power even greater than what you had before. And Baragon's like, there are no powers greater than me, foolish mortal. And then, you know, Aizen does the Hogyoku magic trick or whatever. And then, you know, like, Baragon, like, grows flesh. Like, slow. Oh, God, what's that? It's like the Lich from Adventure Time. Like, whoa, whoa, what's going on? What's going on? Oh, God, ah! And then he just becomes, like, a, gr a, gr a grizzled old man. Like, you know? And he's like, ah. Oh god, is this what it's like to have flesh? You know, considering Baragon's, like, you know, ancient nature, you'd, you'd like to think, like, okay, Hollows used to be humans at one point. Baragon, I mean, he's a human skeleton, but just because of how ancient he is, the idea that maybe he was just uh, a being that always existed in Hueco Mundo, I mean, he might have been a human, like, a really, really long time ago, like, in the time of antiquity. Um, but it's possible he might have just been there from day one, and the fact he might have never had flesh before, and be like, whoa, okay, this feels weird. It's like my entire body is, like, covered with, like, I don't know, like, this weird viscous, oh, I, I, oh, I can feel my muscles, oh, I can feel my tendons, like, stretching, that's so weird, you know? Um, but apparently, I guess it worked, I mean, all hollows get a little bit of a strength boost, at least when they become a wrong car, so I guess that was the case for Baragon there. Um, but because Baragon's aspect of death is time and age, and he literally has the ability of Respira to age anything he desires at any time, um, that profound area Arrogance really shines through because he's basically he knows he's 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 king shit essentially he knows he's like my power is 
absolute. Um, it affects everybody indiscriminately. It doesn't matter who you are or what you are. If you're a human, Shinigami, Quincy, Hollow, doesn't matter. If my power, if my respira touches you, you age and you die, as is the decree of the god of time, the god of aging. Age comes for all of us. It doesn't discriminate. Um, you know, it's the ultimate uh, arbiter of death, the neutral plane. You know, we went over this when we did uh, Harry Bell's video, but yeah, it, it really is the most neutral. There's some Espada that are a little bit more negative, like you have like Grim Jow's Destruction or Noitra's Despair, and then you have some positive ones that could be viewed that way, sort of like um, Harry Bell's Sacrifice can be viewed in, viewed in a positive way. I've also been told that Neliel's aspect, and this is something that wasn't revealed in the canon of the manga, this was something that was revealed later in like the light novels, I've, I've seen it as regret and lamentation as like certain aspects of Neliel so we'll get into hers but um yeah Baragon basically knows like mine is time all right like I literally have the power to age anything I want so it's no surprise that he would and, and also he's the king of an entire dimension essentially there's no surprise why he wouldn't become as, as arrogant as he was and that's the whole theme with his character right to the point where Baragon himself was kind of a victim, kind of like mass hypocrisy, where it's just like, you know, I am a king, I cannot die, I am the god of Huecomundo. Right after he got finished saying, you know, time is absolute, it comes for everybody, I alone stand above it. And that was something Hachi even kind of like hypothesized at the end of their fight when Hachi finally, you know, finished him off with his like farewell box and he transferred part of um, his arm into Baragon's stomach and Baragon himself decayed. Hachi questioned like maybe the whole reason why he was so like arrogant and he was so obsessed with like being a god and everything was because at the end of the day, he knew that he was not um, exempt from his own powers. He would go around every single day saying, you know, you are mortals, you are mere, he called everybody ants, you are all ants before me, you all die from the hands of time. Even when, uh, you know, Hachi used his keto, like that keto seal, he's just like, there might be a keto that could last for thousands or even tens of thousands of years, but nothing is eternal. And then right after that, he's like, oh, I'm a god, I'll live forever. And so Hachi's like, I think he was afraid of death just like every other living thing. He was a living thing. He was a little bit of an unorthodox living thing, but he was still a living thing. Um, and I think he knew better than anybody that the, the, the stretches of time, the annals of time were coming for him. Uh, he might live a really long time, just like he said about the keto spell. He's like, maybe Baragon could live for 10 million years, but nothing is eternal. And that was the whole, that was, that ended up holding true, did it not? It's just like, that was Baragon's philosophy, except for himself, but even with himself, it ended up not being true. So, yeah, that, that was a big theme with uh, Baragon's character, and it's really interesting when you go back. In fact, I think even the name of the chapter, one of the chapters where he fought against Hachi was debating life from God's viewpoint. Um, there's a lot of philosophy to unpack here and I kind of wish like out of the three Espada that came to Karakura Town Baragon was definitely the one that got the most expounded upon you could tell uh, Kubo really wanted to tell a lot of stuff with this character to the point where he might have even taken up some of like Harry Bell's you know backstory to tell Baragon's because Harry Bell really got no backstory in the manga whatsoever um, it was mostly Stark a little bit and then Baragon even more so so maybe Kubo was sitting there like well Man, this is gonna really, like, I might not be able to tell as much about Stark and Harry Bell as I want, but I really want to tell Baragon's story. I want to really hammer it into the people of, like, he thinks of himself as a deity, he can control aging, he's profoundly arrogant, and it's gonna be that arrogance that, that's gonna, like, ultimately end in his death. He's gonna be, like, the mass hypocrisy and, like, disappear into dust. Um, keep in mind that even though he was the number two Espada, he himself, I'm put this crown over here, that looks good, um, even when he was, uh, the number two, he never actually, you know, announced himself as number two, because I felt like that just goes against his whole character and his whole message that he was trying to send to the world and everything, like, he would never announce himself, like, I am Espada number two, Baragon Uisenborn! No, even to his last dying breath, he's like, I am the king of Huecomundo, I am the god of Huecomundo, and very much like a lot of other the Espada. There was some of the Espada, like Stark, that were uh, very thankful to Aizen for helping them. Zomari viewed him as basically like his Christ figure, like, oh, hell, all praise to Aizen-sama. But there were a lot of other Espada, you could tell, that were either just indifferent toward Aizen, or they really hated him. Like, Noitra, you could tell, really didn't want to take orders. Uh, Grimjow as well. Grimjow really didn't want to take orders from Aizen. It was just like, okay, he's stronger than all of us. We could try to fight back, and I'm sure we've, like, like Grimjow has tried to fight back. I'm sure Bar 
Aragon tried to fight back at one point, but it was very, very, very abundantly clear that Aizen could destroy you in a second. Now, Grimjow, yeah, he always had that thing like, I am the king, I'm the king of the jungle, I'm a damn panther for God's sake. But that's like, like the petulations of a teenage child compared to Baragon. Baragon was the straight up god of this entire dimension. Pretty much putting in new phrase for like, big fish in a small pond sort of deal. There was just nobody, nobody that could even um, attempt to come close to him. Except there was, uh, this is once again going to the Can't Fear Your Own World novel, there was this hollow that has this really complicated name, like Eco My, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce it. But in the Can't Fear Your Own World novel, there's this really ancient hollow that rivaled the power of, ba power of Baragon, and it's just as ancient as he, as he was. And a very, very, very long time ago, um, you know, it, they basically had a peace treaty with one another. Like, okay, just do, we're not getting involved with each other's affairs. You go off to your, like, you know, the, the west side, the far reaches of Wicamundo. You do your thing. I'll stay over here and do my thing. And I'll be the king and whatever. And basically, Baragon just kind of, like, tried to, like, remove this hollow's uh, presence and existence from his mind. Because he was the only hollow that even rivaled his strength. Um, and then, of course, you know, I, only, you know, not even the only hollow, the only being that rivaled rivaled Baragon's strength until Aizen and his entourage showed up, you know, like literally, literally hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of years later, okay, because we're talking like a really, really long time ago. Um, but yeah, you know, so this isn't like Grimjow, like rebelling against Aizen, this is, you know, literally, I am the god of this place, you slaughtered all of my men, took my throne from me, and forced me into your own army, forced this 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 human shinigami form upon me which you know a lot of the arongkar are probably like oh the, you know becoming an arongkar made me stronger but you know aizen is i mean i mean uh, baragon was just like look shinigami are are beneath me you know and then you know aizen turned him into one once again baragon probably didn't ask for that it was probably forced upon him you know um the the whole concept of becoming stronger you know like that that escaped baragon he's like i am the strongest you know, the fact that he was defeated so easily by Aizen's Kyoka Suigets, um, it messed with him in a psychological way that he probably couldn't even admit to himself, you know. Um, but, you know, he was forced into that place. And you know, Baragon spent every waking moment while he was a member of Aizen's army, he spent every solitary second thinking of a way to kill Aizen. That was the only thing he thought about. Uh, all of his Fraxion were devoutly loyal to him. They were like his most loyal subjects, like Findor and uh, Pau and everybody. They had the throne for him and all that stuff. They would go and die for him uh, at a moment's notice. Um, that was his like loyal entourage. And you probably think they had like meetings like every night trying to figure out a way to like poison Aizen or like destroy him some other way. And Aizen knew about it. You know Aizen definitely knew about it. He's like, oh, oh, Gein, come over here. Oh, look, Baragon's getting his little book club together. They're playing cards. They're trying to figure out a way to kill me again. Oh, this is adorable. Come on, let's watch. And he's like, click. And Baragon's like, all right, men, how are we going to get rid of the bastard? And Findor's like, well, we could poison him. We could poison his tea. He likes to drink tea. Eyes and sitting there like, uh, uh, oh, that's so adorable. They think they can kill me. Um, I, I mean, that's a little bit hyperbolic, but, you know, that's probably what Baragon was doing, right? And he's like, all right, all right, fine. I'll do what he says. I'll obey him. I'll, I'll, I'll arrive when he summons me. I'll do what he tells me and all that stuff. Um, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to wait for that moment, that key moment, and I'm going to take him out. Now, unfortunately, Baragon never really had that moment. <laughs> he never really had that moment. Uh, the closest moment he got was literally when he was in the process of dying. His last act, his dying breath, was spent cursing Aizen and trying to take his life in one more futile um, effort. You know, where Hachi disintegrates him, Soyphone's there and everything, and Soyphone blasted half of his face off with her uh, Jakuho Raikoben. But despite all that, I, Baragon doesn't even care. Baragon is, he knows he's dying. He knows he's at death's door. He looks over at Aizen, who's just standing there, and he lifts up the Grand Kaida in one more futile, you know, like, <sighs> you, I'll never forgive you for dragging me down from where I was. I'm going to kill you someday with my own guillotine slash battle axe, whatever the hell it is, Aizen. And so he lifts up the Grand Kaida, and he's like, Aizen. <sighs> he throws it at him. Aizen just gives him the side eye. He's just like, hmm? Hmm? <laughs> That's all Aizen gives him. Like, the, the amount of attention that you would give to, like, a fly buzzing around your head. Like, if you're out for a nice leisurely Sunday stroll and just, hmm? Huh? Uh. 
That's all he gives it. He he gives a passing glance over to the Grand Kaida. It disintegrates before it even gets close to him, and Aizen's just like, huh. And then goes back to paying attention to whatever else he was. That's like the ultimate insult to the to the god of Wikimundo. His last act of this deity that ruled over this entire dimension is met with just like, you know, indifference. The last ultimate middle finger to I, to, to Baragon from Aizen. Yep. Um, but that doesn't diminish his power. All right. He was a extraordinarily strong hollow. All right. And quite literally, like anything that Respira did touch decayed, whether it be like an inanimate object, he disintegrated Soyphone's arm, um, even the blast from Jakoho Raikoban when Soyphone shot that giant, like, one shot kill missile directly at Baragon, he used the Respira to decay the missile to, like, it detonated before it even hit him. You know, even an attack that's, like, super fast and super powerful like that, he was able to decay. You try to drop a nuke or a hydrogen bomb on freaking Baragon, he could just decay it before it even gets to him, right? Um, so his power was devastating. You you wonder about, like, what Aizen said when actually Soyphone tried to fight him. When Aizen uh, was going up against uh, the Nigeki Katetsu, that two shots kill that, you know, Soyphone used. Because everyone in the fandom was like, oh, wait, Soyphone just has to use her two, sh two hits kill and then Aizen will die. And so she tries that. I'm glad that Kubo actually in included that in the story he didn't just write it off as just like oh yeah we're never gonna see what happens with that no soyphone tries to use nigeki katetsu like foo, foo, against aizen and what happens um he basically just smirks at her just like ah ah shinigami battles are a battle of riatsu you might have that unique ability but i have more riatsu than you so that means that your abilities can never harm me whatsoever i have a few questions about that i was thinking about that last night actually i'm thinking okay Shinigami battles are battles of Riatsu. Now, keep in mind, Shinigami are beings literally comprised of, like, spiritons and, like, uh, reishi and Riatsu. That's, that's all they are. Their entire bodies are made up of this stuff. So, if we're gonna take Aizen's words at face value there, like, I have more Riatsu than any single Shinigami. And I buy that. I completely buy that. He has more Riatsu, more power than Shunsui, than probably even Yamamoto... Um, like, he just has an ungodly amount of, like, raw phys like, raw reishi. Okay, fine. Maybe not Yamamoto, but pretty much everybody else, okay? And then, of course, Ichigo when he goes into his, you know, um, his, his um, you know, uh, Dongai form, but that's not until later. Um, by that logic, shouldn't that therefore indicate that, like, any keto spell shouldn't be able to even touch him? Swords shouldn't even be able to cut him? Because the swords are also made out of reishi, you know, Shinji was able to slice Aizen, Uohara, which Uohara is incredibly skilled, and Uohara might not be the best example, because he's literally been, like, a mad genius that's been developing, like, um, specific keto just to take on Aizen, um, but I'm sure Aizen, in terms of just raw Riatsu, has more than, than Uohara or Yoroichi even did, um, that's, like, his big thing that he does, so I, I'm curious, like, what exactly does that mean, like, oh, you know, I have more Riatsu, so therefore I can't be harmed by your Negeki Katetsu ability, shouldn't he also be immune to pretty much any other ability, and they were able to injure him, not a lot, but they were able to cut him, they were able to blast him with Keto and stuff, I'm basically just trying to question, like, what would happen if Baragon's Respira actually did hit Aizen? You know, what would actually happen if he didn't block it? Because Aizen has a bunch of barriers and keto spells constantly protecting him. But if he didn't have any of that, if he was just like, the Respira like just hit his hand, would it decay? Or would it just be like, you know, my hand will not decay because my Riatsu is stronger than yours? You know, would it be something like that? I question it because his power was pretty damn absolute from what we saw, even to himself. Um, although Hachi did say at the end of the battle, he's like, well... There must have been some other kind of ability outside of his body that prevented the Respira from affecting him from the outside in, but from the inside out, like, transferring his, like, arm that was already decaying inside of Baragon's stomach. He didn't have that same protection on the inside of his body, or I should I say skeleton, yo ho ho ho, um, and so that's what ended up killing him. But, um, yeah, interestingly enough, right? Also, interestingly enough, Baragon never used a Cero. Yeah, weird, isn't it? The, the prime like, defining character trait of a hollow, like, their biggest, strongest attack, like, the Cero. Cero, you know, Doble. Gran Rey Cero. Cero Oscaras. You know, all these really unique different abilities, and, you know, like, uh, Stark had his Cero Metorieta. He had all these really cool abilities with Ceros. The king, the god of Huecamundo, never used a Cero. 
never used Abala, never even really used, I guess Herio, sort of, like when, um, you know, Hachi used the four beast barrier, and then, you know, Soifone launched Jakuho, and it, like, blasted part of his, uh, like, his uh, skull off, maybe that was his Herio that managed to protect him there, maybe it was the Herio that managed to protect him from Respira, his Herio was just that good, um, didn't really use any of the other hollow techniques, once again, Maybe not talking about, like, he just didn't choose to, but maybe because he is, like, literally so ancient of a being, he just didn't have the capacity. He just never used it because he didn't have it. He's like, oh, you know, basic, you know, like, like um, you know, childish tricks like the Sero or the Bala are beneath a god such as myself. I don't need to fire off a death laser. I have Respira. That's all I need. And I'll be straight up with you. I mean, yeah, I guess that is really all you need. Because if you fire off a Sero, a Sero is just like a big ball of condensed reishi, um, you know, fired off an incredible, like, magnification and, like, you know, high power and everything. Maybe Barragan's Respira, like, would operate the same way it decayed the Keto, just like the Respira would just, like, disintegrate the Sero blast anyway, so it doesn't even matter. Like, he's above all that, right? Um... I kind of want to see, like, he was mentioned in the Can't Fear Your Own World novel, but he was still dead. It wasn't like he got back to life or anything. He was just mentioned in flashbacks and stuff. It would actually have been really cool to get, like, a Baragon-themed, like, light novel, like, all about, like, his backstory and stuff. Um, he might not have been, like, a super prevalent character. He was only really prevalent for that one battle. But still, like, I, there's a lot of stuff to unpack with him. I would love to, like, explore his, like, his uh, backstory, like, how he came into existence and where his place in Waco Mundo was and did he always regard himself as a god was there something else going on in his life you know what kind of being even really was he you know truly you know if he wasn't like a hundred percent of Asto Lorde he might have been something else like what he would have called himself or did he come up with the name Baragon Luisenbarn you know whatever was he like oh man okay well I mean like I don't know how Kubo would do it exactly but maybe he was like the ghost or the hall like the first human to ever become a hollow like, way back in antiquity, way back in, like, caveman times, there was, like, a brutal, like, caveman that, like, ruled over the entire, like, you know, the straw huts or whatever, the mud huts or whatever they had back then, you know, I am the master of, it was just this warlord caveman, and then he died, and he was the first human to become a hollow, because there had to be one, you figure at some point there had to be one, you know, hollow that existed, you know, just, just the one, you know, and then that was Baragon, and then that was it. Um, I'm kind of reminded that there's this old Canadian show, not really old. It was like in the 2000s. It was called The Collector. And it was a series about the devil and uh, making deals with various humans. And I've mentioned it before because I really like the show. It's been off the air for like, you know, no one remembers it. It's been from like 2006. It's been off the air. Well, anyway, there's a scene in one of the episodes where we go back in time to like the 13th century and there's a monk talking to the devil and the devil just takes the appearance of like a regular human. And the monk asks the devil, like, how old are you anyway? And like, actually, how old are you? And then the devil is like, um, I couldn't tell you. Like, I'm older than Moses, I'm older than the pyramids or the hanging gardens of Babylon. I've been around since the very first thing that could be called a human had the very first thing that could be even called a desire. But to be honest with you, I've been around for a lot of time, like, for long before that even. So it might have been something similar to Baragon. Like, he was around even before humans existed. It might even be something like that, right? Um... So there's really not a lot for me to talk about in terms of his techniques, because he only used the one, but it was, albeit, a very strong technique. But we can talk about his ridiculously badass, can't fear your own world design with the Hogyoku power-up. I gotta be straight up with you. We saw a lot of really cool ones of these. Like, we saw Starks with, the, like, the Riatsu bandoliers. Like, that's really cool. Uh, Nels is really cool when we get to hers. Noitra's was really badass with the different, like, right, like the arms, like the Praying Mantis and the different scythes. That was really cool. Like, the scythe arms. That was really cool. But this one is probably the most badass easily. Are you ready? ba 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 Baragon! Bam! Right? Like, holy shit! Death God Reaper Emperor Baragon. This is when, like, okay, he dresses like this when he's just, like, in his normal, like, kingly attire. Like, he's just, it's another Tuesday ruling over Hueco Mundo. But when he's doing, like, his really fancy, like, processions, like, if he actually has holidays in Hueco Mundo, like, I'm bored. I will create a holiday just for me. I will call it Ruiz and Bond Day. This is how he dresses for that. You know, he gets the elegant, um, you know, the coat, the cape, the Grand Kaida gets an upgrade. He's got the jewelry, the epic crown. It's like, I am the emperor! 
You know, like, if he went up against Aizen dressed like that, I think Aizen's head would have just exploded from the sheer badassness, right? I mean, it is just so damn cool. Um, I love it. And it was in the, it was in the Brave Souls game, I believe, is when it was utilized, um... But, uh, still, the artwork is by Kubo, of course. Like, he's the one that still drew it, I believe. And so, it just looks incredible. I love it. Uh, probably my favorite one. I mean, I like Hari Bells. I couldn't even show you Hari Bells. Some people have said, you didn't show Hari Bells. Go and Google Hari Bell Can't Fear Your Own World, like, you know, design her, like, second Resurrection. You'll see pretty quickly why I couldn't have shown that. Or I was kind of like, I don't know if I could get away with that on YouTube. There's a lot of boobage, and not even that, like... The Hokyoku is, like, literally in her, like, yeah. So, there's a reason why I couldn't have shown that. But Baragons is the most badass, by, by far. You know, not the sexiest. Well, hmm, maybe. Maybe a contender for the sexiest, but it's definitely the most badass, right? Incredible. Alright, well, um, that is what I have to say about the uh, God King Emperor of Huecomundo. Uh, may he rest in peace. You gotta feel like Stark even felt bad for him. You're like, man... That, like, because after, after Baragon died, like, Stark is like, wow, number two's dead and nobody even says anything. Wow. The god of Huecomundo, for literally thousands and thousands of years, maybe even longer, just died. Kind of a wimpy death. Kind of just like a... And by his own power, he kind of just got, like, re rebounded on himself. That's how he dies. And no one says a thing. Stark actually kind of felt bad for him. You know, Stark was just like, man, we weren't that close, but... He was the god of Hueco Mundo, and that's how he dies, and no one's even, no one even cares, no one even says anything. Man, that sucks. That, that, and Stark had a moment where he connected back to him, because he's like, man, that's kind of like the loneliness and the solitude that I felt my whole life. Man. Anyway, and so that kind of gives him a little bit of motivation to fight against Rose and Love, and eventually Shunsui and everybody, but Stark dies sooner after that anyways. But it was an interesting moment between the two, right? Uh, even though Stark and Baragon, I don't believe, ever really had... The, the only interaction they've ever had with each other is after Aizen and Gin and Tozen got locked in that, uh, you know, that Fortress Blaze technique by Yamamoto. Uh, they were trying to decide who was going to call the shots, and Baragon kind of like, well, since... Uh, the Aizen's locked in there. I guess I'll give the orders from now on. As long as we don't have any objections. And he kind of like side eyes over at Stark. Because he knows Stark is number one. And you know he's not. And so Stark is just like I don't care dude. Do whatever you want. <clears throat> right. And so there was like a little bit of a moment where animosity you could tell before them. But Stark felt, still felt bad for him. You know because it's like man somebody could say something. It's like well this is the god of time. We knew him well. Um... You know, uh, let's all gather around and say some words. Uh, he was the most uh, bony king that we've ever had. Yo -ho -ho -ho! His uh, mighty eye sockets uh, led to a black abyss of nothingness. Um, the most that I've ever known. Yo -ho -ho! His mighty guillotine, which was really a battle axe, but he liked to call it a guillotine, was the sharpest weapon in all of the lands. Um, if only he would have, I don't know had some magical barrier power to protect his stomach, which he didn't even really have because, once again, he was a skeleton. And, yo -ho -ho, he will be remembered in all of our hearts. You know, like, something at least like that. Like, that was a really crappy eulogy. That was a really shitty one, but at least it was something, okay? <laughs> all right, well, anyway, um, <laughs> hope you guys enjoyed the video. That was Baragons. Have a great night, everybody. Teching. <laughs> I am the future. This'll happen to every one of you. <sighs> okay, I, I, I joke around about that, but Baragon really does let you think about, like, the existentialism of, of reality. Like, I, I didn't want to get too into it, because that's, like, really extreme stuff, but I seriously, I just don't want to end this video without nailing in, like... The stuff that Baragon said was not something just Kubo created for his manga or, or for his story. Like, everything Baragon said was true. Time is absolute. We are all going to age. We all are currently aging. I'm older now than when I started this video. We're all going to age, and that clock is going to tick down. And if nothing else caps us off on this earth, eventually the, the Reaper really will call for all of us. And uh, that's, I think, what made his character so powerful, right? His, his message, right? 
um, especially his own death, you know, like his own hypocrisy, which I've, I've gone into that. But I just I just want to bring it up again because it is something that's like like so real. And of course, the younger you are, the less you think about it. The older you are, the more you realize, like you understand my grandfather fought in World War Two. My grandfather is going to be 98 years old this year. He's born in 1922. All right. Um, you know, I, I I don't sit down and talk to him about this kind of stuff. Like, hey, gr hey, Pappy, do you have any existential crises about your mortality? Like, obviously, you don't do that. Um, but my grandfather, I mean, like, I can't even imagine what it must be like for him. You know, like waking up every day and knowing that I am 98 years old. I am an old, old man. I am older than most people often get. Like, you are lucky to get to 100. I'm hoping my grandfather gets to 100. Uh, my boss at Dollar Tree, uh, she had a grandfather, uh, unfortunately, passed um, in the last few years. But he died uh, at age 104. I went to his 100th birthday party. I remember that. And he was out walking around and everything like that. But I, I can't believe what it must be like when you get that old, you know, to actually think about your life every day. Like, you wake up and you know how old you are. And you know, it's like literally could be any day. Like, quite literally could be any day. That must be insane, and I, I, I like it's all going to happen to all of us at some point. We're all going to get older to the point where we start to, you know, realize our own moral, mor morality, our mortality, and we're going to be like, wow, yeah, that, that Reaper, he was, uh, he was a, he was a couple miles away, but now he's a little closer, and uh, now he's even closer. Now he's sharpening that damn scythe. He's walking close, but this is getting a little bit macabre here. So I want to end us out by at least. A song that I really love and a song that is about everlasting life. And that's um, Seasons Don't Fear the Reaper by Blue Oyster Cult. I would like, I, I can't play it for you because copyright and all that stuff. But I would recommend like right now to go listen to that song. If you've listened to it, you know the song. If you haven't, go listen to Blue, uh, Blue Oyster Cult, Don't Fear the, Seasons Don't Fear the Reaper. It's an amazing song just in and of itself. But listen to the message of that song. Seasons Don't Fear the Reaper. Nor do the wind, the sun, or the rain. We can be like they are. Come on, baby, don't fear the reaper. Baby, take my hand. 